well. So we're going to continue talking about limit and continuity. But before doing that, let's review what we learned so far. Review. Well, we start introducing functions with more than one free variable. Z equals to f of x and y. In this case, you have two free variables, x and y. These are free variables. We also learned about the domain and range of the function the domain of a function in two variables domain is a subset of plane, x, y plane, Cartesian plane. So to define the domain of the function, we use set builder notation, the set of all points, x comma y, such that z is equal to f of x and y, or f of x and y is defined. Very well, we talked about the range of the function. The range is a subset of real line. Range is a subset of real line. Well, to define the range of f, you have the set of all z values, just one numbers, z values such that z is equal to f of x and y. So depending on the definition of function, depending on how x and y in the domain behave, we have z values for the range of the function. Well, we talked about contour maps or level pairs to analyze and understand the behavior of the surface or the graph of a function in two variable and we use level surfaces to understand and analyze the graph of function in three variables. So we use level curves to analyze the graph of a function like z equals to f of x and y. What do we do basically? We take the definition of function and we slice that by some planes, z equals to one, z equals to zero, z equals to three, z equals to a half and so on. We set f of x and y equals to k. Remember that z equals to k are parallel planes in the space. We slice the graph by these parallel planes and we get an intersection between this plane and the surface in two dimension. It gives us a general idea, general behavior of the graph of the function in 2D. And eventually we can use those level curves if we are using paper and pencil to graph the function actually approximately. We use level surfaces to analyze the graph of, well, in this case, we have W equals, to, let's say, G of X, Y, and Z. Well, in this case, we try to slice this graph by W equals to some fixed numbers. It gives us a general idea of this four dimensional object in 3D. Very well, we talked about the graph, then we were interested in analyzing the limit of a function. So let me write down the level surfaces. To analyze the limit of z equals to f of x and y, 
at zero and zero, we have some steps. Step one, plug in zero and zero into the function. If it gives you a unique number, then you're done. Okay, that's the limit of your function. Two, if not, if you have, for example, zero over zero, or if you have infinity over infinity, something of an indeterminate form, then we're interested in using general paths to analyze the limit of that function. We use y equals mx or x equals to my or y equals to square root of mx or y equals to mx squared and so on. By investigation, we find the best path that helps us to analyze the function. Then we simplify, simplify the function by getting rid of one of the variables. We either have a function in x or we have a function in y. After simplifying, if you have m, a combination of m, it means that the limit is not going to be unique and the limit doesn't exist. If it has m, then the limit does not exist. Well, today I'm going to give you two methods to analyze the limit and check to see if the limit exists at zero and zero or not. Very well, before talking about these methods, we're going to go back to elementary calculus. Remember the squeeze theorem? Recall. Squeeze or sandwich theorem. This theorem says if you have a function like f bounded between two other functions like g and h, if the limit of g and h while x approaches a is equal to l, they have the same limit, then you can conclude that the limit of the middle function is also equals to l. So let f, g, and h be functions. And suppose your function f of x is bounded between g of x and h of x. If the limit of g of x as x approaches a is equal to the limit of h of x as x approaches a, then for sure you can say that the limit of the middle function is equal to the limit of these two functions and it is equal to L when x approaches a. Then we can conclude that the limit of f of x as x approaches a is also l. Sometimes you have complex function, complicated function, and it's easier to find two other functions below and above that function. And it's easier to find the limit of those two functions. When you have the limit of those two functions, you can easily use the squeeze theorem to find the limit of the middle function. Example. In this example, we have show that the limit of x y squared divided by x squared plus y squared as x and y approaches zero and zero is equal to zero. Okay. Well, let's see what do we have here. This is 
is my function. It has something on the numerator. It has something on the denominator. What I'm going to do, I'm going to find a lower and upper function like G and H, then find the limit of those simple function, and then easily find the limit of those simpler functions and show that those functions have the same limit. And then I can conclude that the limit of this complex function is equal to zero. Very well. So we're going to go back to algebra. From algebra, we know that y squared divided by x squared plus y squared is always between 0 and 1. Yeah, it's simple algebra. You have something on the numerator and your denominator is larger than your numerator. It's always a number. It's always a fraction between zero and one. It might be zero, it might be one as well. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply all sides by X. And in order to keep the if equality intact, I'm going to use the absolute value. Then it doesn't matter if you're using x or if you're using negative x, you're going to get to the same exact conclusion. Let us multiply both sides by absolute value of x. Suppose you only consider the positive x values. You can just get rid of absolute value of x, multiply it by x, and if x is negative, you have to flip these inequalities. So you get zero less than equals to y squared absolute value of x divided by x squared plus y squared less than equals to absolute value of x. Well, all of these terms are positive. It means that if you put everything inside the absolute value, there is no difference between this and this guy. Absolute value of x, y squared divided by x squared plus y squared. Basic algebra. So I found two functions, simpler functions that this function. This is going to be my function g, and this is going to be my function h. Well, note that the limit of 0 as x approaches 0, y approaches 0, is equal to the limit of absolute value of x as x approaches 0. Both of these are equal to 0. So limit of g is equal to limit of h as x approaches to zero or y approaches to zero. We can include both. It's equal to zero. So squeeze theorem says the middle function is also have limit equal to zero. The limit of x y squared divided by x squared plus y squared as x equal goes to zero y goes to zero is equal to zero. Let me add both x and y here, even though this guy doesn't have any y in it. That's absolutely fine. They're only working with one variable. So a squeeze theorem helps me to find the limit and show that the limit is equal to zero. Very well. So what is the second technique? I'm going to use the same function and show you the second technique, which is very efficient, very helpful, very useful in showing the limit is equal to a number. 
So in this method, we're going to use polar coordinates. Polar coordinates, have I seen it before? Of course. So recall that. In polar coordinates, we convert x and y into r theta. x and y is converted into r and theta this way. We say that hey, x is equal to r cosine theta, and y is equal to r sine theta. Very well. So as x and y approaches zero and zero, your radius here, when you're talking about r cosine, r sine, x squared plus y squared is r squared, cosine squared plus r squared, sine squared theta. It means that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Here you have a circle with radius with radius r. As x and y approaches zero and zero, your radius is getting closer and closer to zero. It means that you're squeezing your circle. So let us use polar coordinates to find the Polar coordinates. Here you have the limit of x y squared divided by x squared plus y squared as x and y approaches zero and zero. Wherever I see x, I'm going to use r cosine. Wherever I see y, I'm going to use r sine theta. And then try to simplify, find the limit. This is equivalent to finding the limit of r cosine theta times r sine theta squared divided by r squared cosine squared theta plus r squared sine squared theta as r goes to zero. This is your circle and you're shrinking your circle. It means that the radius approaches zero. Okay, let's see what do we have. So this is equal to, these limits are equivalent to each other. Limit of, here you have r cosine theta, r squared sine squared theta divided by r squared cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. This guy is equal to one as r approaches zero. Very well. So here on the numerator and the denominator, you can cancel out r squared and r squared. What's left? You have the limit of r cosine theta, sine squared theta. And remember that this guy is equal to one and r goes to zero. This is zero times cosine times sine squared, which is zero. So we just showed that the limit is equal to zero. 